live. Hello, hello. Welcome to um, everybody in Steve's ch uh, Steve's chat and Steve's video. I'm also live on mine. This is um, I'm Darren. My kind of podcast slash um, research program, if you want to call it that, is called Seeking Eye. It's um, started for my own kind of benefit to learn what I can about the subjects of life after death. Um, that's originally how it started, uh, which came about through depression and anxiety, which caused me a huge fear of death. Just a minute, I need to mute yours because I'm getting my voice twice in the ear. That's very often. Um, and yeah, the, the fear of death kind of put me into this kind of area um, through depression. And I've had the lovely opportunity of speaking with um, Jan, as well as many other researchers in the field. And I've learned a hell of a lot over the past two years. Um, I started off as kind of a, a Say it's an atheist. As an atheist, am I, Jim? Would you say more an agnostic? That would be a different video altogether. <laughs> yeah, that's a completely different video. But kind of, I always believe that there was no such thing as life after death. Consciousness comes from the brain, and once you die, that's it. it lights out forever. And um, I am someone that is pretty difficult to convince, but the research I've done has managed to do that, so at least to a certain level. Always keep an open mind. Um, but Jan is, in my opinion, now. I, I uh, I always class you as a friend, Jan. I don't know if you class me as the same. Absolutely, Darren. <laughs> and Jan is, in my opinion, probably the world's leading researcher in the near-death experience, alongside probably Bruce Grayson. Yeah, currently... I, I, count, I count Bruce as number one, but yeah, you it's would nice do that. of you to say. Jan's currently the um, president of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which um, I'll let Jan talk about what that is, um, as well as you. Are you currently the editor of the... Journal of Near Death Studies or the past? That's right. That's right. Currently the yeah. editor. So mm -hmm. um, if, if I pass everybody over to Jan, if you want to kind of talk about who you are and what you do and what the IANS group does. Okay, great. Um, well, I, um, in 1988, I completed my doctoral degree in counseling and uh, took a faculty position at the University of North Texas, where I was on faculty for 31 years until this past fall when I retired from the university. And during those years, my research focus was near-death experiences and related experiences because as we'll undoubtedly get into here, um, near-death I completed contain a lot of experiences that occur also under other circumstances, not just close brushes with death. And um, so, in the course of that time, of course, I did a lot of studies and published a lot and so forth, but I also became associated with the International Association for Near-Death Studies. That's where uh, in, in their uh, refereed um, journal, I uh, stu uh, published my dissertation study and uh, over the years published occasionally in that journal. And then uh, about 15 years ago, the founding editor, Bruce Grayson, who Darren was just mentioning, and I consider absolutely the number one researcher on NDEs, um, was, uh, had been the editor for uh, like um, 20 years. And uh, so he asked me if I would take over editorship. So I've been editing that, uh, that refereed scholarly journal for the past many years. Um, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, to kind of step back to a broader picture, was uh, founded in 1981. And, and I should say that the field of near-death studies formally opened in 1975 with Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life. And in that book, he coined the term near-death experience and really introduced the phenomenon to um, the population at large and most professionals as well. Um, and it was the culmination of uh, that during the 20th century, resuscitation techniques had gotten so good that people were being brought back from the brink of death in unprecedented numbers. And because of this, a lot of a lot more people were having near-death experiences, which is not the same as surviving a close brush with death. We'll probably get into that here in a minute. Um, and uh, so uh, actually these phenomena have been recorded throughout history and across cultures and even uh, reported in scholarly journals previously, but nobody had like a name for them. And so it never really like coalesced into a focused area of study. 
until Moody's book in 75. And, um, and then in 1981, Moody and Bruce Grayson and a, a few other people founded the association. And the original primary purpose was to support research because um, the uh, scholarly academia was generally speaking pretty um, prejudiced and biased against uh, research into this area because these are experiences that can't be directly observed. And so they're, um, you know, not the kind of thing that, um, that materialist scientists are wanting to focus on. So uh, Bruce and, and Raymond and a few other people saw the need for an association where researchers could collaborate and um, produce a scholarly journal. And um, then the, the association quickly um, expanded, I guess I would say, into a second and third mission, second one being education to disseminate the results of research, and the third being um, support for people who had had near-death experiences and people who work with near-death experiencers like um, medical professionals and mental health professionals. So uh, we have researchers, experiencers, and, um, and professionals who have some interest in the experience. And then of course, just the general public who is, um, tends to be pretty interested in the phenomenon too. So that's that's a quick. Do you have any questions about the association? It's the uh, if you're interested, you can go to the website at www.iands.org. IANS International Association for Near Death Studies. Mm -hmm. Steve, if, if I can, if we can kind of rely on you to have a look at the questions that come through. Yeah, um, I'll be paying attention to my live I'll, chat here. My um, eyes. Yeah, I mean, anyone that's wondering why my eyes keep darting up like this, I've got Steve's chat up in the in the corner, so I'm keeping an eye no on No questions, questions so there. far, just basically, this no. is super interesting. <laughs> it is interesting, it is. yeah. It is very interesting. Especially, I mean, you need really an open mind to really question this kind of stuff because it does go against, I mean, the, some of the conclusions, or the majority of the conclusions that um, the researchers draw do seem to go against what we believe to be mm -hmm. the, the foundation of, of reality and it does require an open mind to really look into this stuff um it might be worth if if we give a brief um definition of what the near-death experience is when most people think of a near-death experience as you say there is a difference between i mean it's a matter of definitions but technically you could say a near-death experience is simply a closed brush with death which yes that's one way but that's mm -hmm. not what exactly we're talking about mm -hmm. what we're right. talking about is a series of um of conscious experiences that take place it may not even be when we are in direct contact with with death it could be through a fear of being close to death but the experiences are essentially very very similar and they include often but not always uh, a tunnel if a feeling of traveling down a tunnel a bright light which seems to have some kind of personality and and some kind of drawing um vibration to it if you want to use that word i don't like that word but you know it, you can use that word um deceased relatives or, or individuals that people see you could see religious or spiritual um idols many people report seeing jesus at least in the western world but others do see figures based on their culture um, and a variety of other, I mean, there could be as many descriptions of a near-death experience as there are people, because everybody is slightly different, although there are very similar foundations. And um, I'm pretty sure that's culturally based. I think Jan has a very similar idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, yes, that um, the way that I think about near-death experiences is um, that of all the people who survive a close brush with death, about 90%, 80 to 90% won't remember anything unusual. Um, they, if they lost consciousness, it was just lights out until they regain consciousness and you know nothing particular. But 10 to 20% of people report uh, this, as Darren said, this experience of conscious, their consciousness functioning apart from their physical body. 
And I usually um, think of the NDE as having three aspects. One is a, a sense of absolute peace, which sometimes precedes the the onset of the of the more of the next two the other mm -hmm. two aspects. Mm -hmm. And then there's a material aspect. I call it the material aspect because the person's consciousness, they experience it outside their physical body, but observing the material world. And usually my hands are up here because usually their consciousness is above their body, looking down on the vicinity of their physical body. But um, it doesn't have to be just that area. Um, many people in their NDEs uh, have the experience of leaving the area, the vicinity of their physical body and going to other locations in the material world. And there's a lot more to say about the material aspect yes. of the experience, but the other big um, aspect is the non-material aspect or transmaterial. I prefer the transmaterial because it's like beyond the material world. And there, the, as Darren said, the person experiences um, possibly moving rapidly through space, perhaps through a tunnel or uh, some other sense of enclosure, but not necessarily. They could feel like they're moving rapidly through the stars. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then encountering uh, um, entities and environments that are not of the material world. So they may be see deceased loved ones, spiritual entities, religious entities. The difference between those being religious are associated with a clear religion like Jesus, for example, and spiritual is more um, not, not associated with some particular religious belief. Um, and then environments like uh, some people report earth-like environments, but that are have these vivid colors. Uh, there could be beautiful music playing. Every blade of grass has its own consciousness and things that just don't entirely make sense yeah. um, to us here. So um, yeah, so that's that's mm. that is a, a good overview. It is. I think one point that I'd, I'd make, mainly about my own kind of interest in this, uh, and I'm sure you share the same kind of view, is that the experiences that contain a purely um, transient aspect, which is that they they have all these visions, they they see this landscape, and, and they come back. Those aren't of particular interest to me uh, on on and by themselves i mean they're interested in the fact that there are distinct similarities but they don't provide really to me any kind of strong evidential value whereas the ones that do interest me are the ones as you say that contain veridical material perception especially in situations where all modern neuroscience uh, neurochemistry neurophysiology whatever you want to say tells us that there should be no conscious experience under any right. circumstances they're the ones that really pique my interest because that shouldn't really happen <laughs> and yet yeah it, right, it appears right. To. We, we've had had a couple of questions if um if i can jump in there and ask ask away let me just go back mainly it's regarding the the cause of the near death experience which I, I imagine we'll get into um an intrigued feline asks well i do have one question um from what i gathered one of the hypotheses is that um there is just an overload of brain activity how would this actually work in a body that essentially is dead? Yeah, see, that's one of the that's one of the questions. <laughs> how the yeah. hell can it happen? But it seems like to, good yeah, question. Very good question. <laughs> that's kind of the, the base of the near death experience research. But um, right. we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into that sort of area of the cause. Another one uh, from Spiratory Minds Project asks another common but good one. My question is that according to what I've read on this, there is often a large release of DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine. Um, in the brain with this experience has this been looked at in your research i'm not sure on this one if i'm right jan but from what i've seen it seems that that dmt theory that the brain releases a huge amount of dmt at death which may cause hallucinatory visions like this seems to be a bit of a myth or an overstated kind of fact as yeah. far as i'm aware the evidence to suggest that is not as strong as people trying to imagine it is no, that's right. I don't believe that anyone has ever actually measured DMT being released at death. 
in the brain. So mm -hmm. it's a hypothesis, but not one that to my knowledge so far has um, support. Now there has been research comparing near-death experiences and DMT experiences, and there are some similarities, but there also are some important differences. For example, in DMT uh, experiences, it's common for people to see a circus imagery and also to see, um, to encounter aliens. Mm -hmm. And um, those, neither of those, uh, I don't think I've ever heard a near-death experience that involved circus imagery or encountering aliens. So, so there's, you know, there's some similarity, but some important difference as well. I, I don't have a question, but I, I, if I could touch on that for a second. That'd be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. So one of the things about the near death experiences, and I, by the way, I do find it a very fascinating subject as somebody who is a lucid dreamer all my life. And I do use the mm. term lucid rather than out of body experience. So I think they're completely mm. the same thing, only expressed differently from a different vantage point. I don't believe they're external. I do believe that they're internal. However, I do know mm. that they do exist because I've experienced mm. them all my life. But these are subjective. Yeah. yeah. And, but these are, these are very things that are very, very subjective, right? Obviously, as, as Dr. Holden pointed out, it is very difficult to measure, quantify, and compare subjective experience because our, we have our own sense data, and that sense data is not transportable. You can't just step into somebody else's mind and experience what they've experienced. So we look for commonalities, and this is why uh, experts have said, yes, lucid dreaming is a real phenomenon. Why? Because there have been overwhelming people that have experienced with very similar stories about it, right? And yeah. I think that near-death experience yeah. can be approached the exact same way. But when it comes to the DMT, there, uh, DMT things, I find it very interesting, and I'm going to step into my philosophical realm for, for one minute here. Um, there's a different ways of interpreting why there's a commonality between experiences, especially with DMT. One of them is called neuro, uh, neurotheological reductionism. And that just basically is people experience very similar things because of brain chemistry. Okay, So it's a hardwired effect. And so we're all biological entities. We're all going to experience things very similarly. Um, Near-death experience might be very similar to that. And then there's also what's called a contextualist, where our imagery is based upon our culture. And so you have said something about the, the circus, right, which is mechanistic elves and that kind of imagery. Uh, that could be, it could be a strictly a cultural type thing. Um, and then there's also what's called a literalist, which basically is, hey, these are actually really living entities people are having conversations with. In this case, the NDE would be a literalist position that there is something mind independent of the body. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, certainly nobody doubts that there is a lot of culture involved with these experiences. Yeah. In and fact, I'll, if I could jump in and say something uh, that when I give a NDE 101 talk, you know, basics about near death experiences, I talk about NDEs having three levels. And uh, at the deepest level, there are some universal features. So, and, and when I say universal, I don't mean that uh, e these features necessarily happen in every single experience, but they're very common, very common. In, in experiences. Mm -hmm. And the, the foundational um, experience of the near death experience. Kind of like foundational, yeah. And it, as Darren said, the, um, the presence of light, the experience of overwhelming love, the experience of profound peace, the experience of encountering entities that are not of the physical world, yeah. and, uh, and even the experience of perceiving the material world from a position outside the body. So these are things that really have been found cross-culturally. And uh, one researcher who has looked into this is uh, Jeff Long, who is... Um, one of the webmasters for the Near Death Experience Research Foundation. And at that um, website, which is www.nderfforfoundation.org, um, people from all over the world have registered their near death experiences there. So he's really had an opportunity to compare cross culturally. Um, near-death experiences, and he has a lot translated from other languages and that sort of thing. And so, um, so we know that there are these kind of very common um, fundamental features of experiences. Then at the next level, there's, there's the cultural overlay. And that is that um, 
as Darren said, people, Christians are more likely to see Jesus um, and Buddhists might be more likely to see Buddha. Um, although there are cases where people have, uh, have many cases in which people have seen entities that they didn't even recognize, but later figured out, oh, that was Buddha or something like that. Um, and, and people have uh, a lot of the experience is very surprising to people. It contradicts their expectations. So, so although there is a culture, and, and also people say that what they experience in their NDEs is that their, their phenomenology, their processing is different than it is when they're in the physical body. So they're taking an experience that they're trying to put into, into English or, or their, their native language, which, you know, language was developed to navigate this reality, not some other state of consciousness. And so, um, so the only words that people have to describe what they've experienced are the, the words that come from their culture. So culture may influence how the experience um, unfolds mm -hmm. to some mm -hmm. degree. It may influence how people can even explain the experience. So it's, it's um, inescapable that culture is going to be a factor. But the fact that there are these commonalities across cultures uh, and throughout history um, indicates that there is something deeper than culture going on. And it's not to negate the, the presence of cultural influence. It's to say it's an and thing. There is this deep thing and there's this cultural level. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third level, which is individual, in that I've never heard two near-death experiences that were exactly the same. And many people's experiences contain elements that I've never heard in another experience. And so, so it's, it's just good to be aware that every experience is going to reflect these three levels to some degree, the fundamental level or the kind of universal level, the cultural level, and then the individual level. I'd, I'd raise a question there, Jan, just about the, um, the fundamentals that everything is, is the same generally at the base. Or, or at least very similar and shared across cultures through many, many, many years. Could you not raise the point? And um, I think D Deep Ashtray has, has kind of nailed it there, saying that um, personally he's concluded it's, or she has concluded it's all about how the brain is <laughs> wired. Is he? You can't even assume that sort of thing. That these yeah, days, but I, I know but, my um, audience. <laughs> yeah, he's been around I don't, that's the problem. But he, he's right then. Could we not say that? The similarities are to be expected because generally the human brain is wired exactly the same way throughout the species and so we will find commonality as opposed yeah, to think, it's an ontological base i think that's a, a it's a really good point and and also that um once again because the brain is wired it's um uh, you know it's got its own hard wiring um Many near-death experiencers say that they experienced a lot of things in the NDE that they even knew that they were not able to bring back because we just can't conceptualize them with our limited, you know, brains. And um, and so uh, so absolutely, the um, that may be a factor in the existence of different aspects, the way those aspects are described. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that as long as we're alive, we're going to escape the possibility or the limitations, you know, that, um, that this is related to the brain. Yeah, I think, yeah. A, I think a, a very good way to put it is trying to relate a dream to somebody. Uh, you know, when you wake up, your dream starts being faded um, right off the bat. You, you don't remember most of your dreams. So no. even though you might have had something very profound in your dream, trying to relate to somebody would be very difficult. But I do find something very interesting that you mentioned earlier. Like one of the things in the lucid dreaming, I, uh, I have actually like been in a state where uh, I could actually like lift my arms up, look at them, 
turn my hands around, look right through them, touch them together, have, together, have full tactile sensation. Absolute full tactile sensation. But, of course, my arms are laying down. I mean, now, a property dualist or somebody who thinks that the mind body separation exists such that the mind can exist independently of a physical substrate would probably say that there's some kind of out of body experience. Now I don't take yeah. that route. I do think it is, you know, internalized. However, the experience and stuff such that the evidence could go either way. There is no evidence that I don't think an experiment can be done where you can determine whether it is external external or internal. And you could that you could try to determine if other minds exist in, you know in any kind of real uh, scientific yeah. way, uh, or if reality exists in any kind of real scientific way, we have to make certain assumptions. So it's what you want to look at from your philosophical positions. However, the experiences are very real, and they are very, very convincing. I mean, to say, I mean, look, I'm I'm not a metaphysical naturalist. I'm a methodological naturalist, but but um, you know, I, even I got to say, when you have some kind of experience like that, it makes you pause. It, it makes does. you pause. It's it it is just. Uh, something when you think to yourself, look, I can actually feel my fingers touching each other and yet they're not. <laughs> it's it's a weird sensation. It is. Mm -hmm. And there have been experiments done um, or studies done, especially with Sam Parnia in his AWARE study, but also by doctors such as Dr. Penny Sartori, who I know Jan will be familiar with, in which they've set up targets outside of the body. Um, in other words, I mean, they haven't stapled anything inside people god forbid but they've set up targets around the operating room um during cardiac arrest or in in wars that deal with that sort of thing as an aim of if someone comes out of their body they should be able to see this target all of them have failed at the moment and they haven't yielded positive results which generally is to be expected because i think Sampania had a study of was it two thousand or four thousand i don't know but it was, it was in the thousands and mm -hmm. from that, one person had a material out-of-body experience that they were able to record and were well enough to be interviewed, and they didn't see the target. And people will often come to you, especially the skeptics will say, well, these, these um, experiments have never yielded positive results. You would need tens and tens of thousands of people to get a reasonable sample size of people that have had experiences, including material um, apparently non-physical non veridical perception in order to gauge because if 2,000 or 4,000 I can't remember people will yield one person who's able to be interviewed but that has the presupposition That's, though that they're they're able to uh, in their altered state because regardless of what the verticality issue is uh, there's going to be an altered state of mind and when you're let's say you're floating down a tunnel I've, I've I've taken trips to other planets in a lucid state you know and you so you're traveling down a corridor you're trying to read things everything is altered in some capacity you are by definition in an altered type of mind state so I think the presupposition that if you have a target you're gonna be able to get it correct um, is just that it's a presupposition so to me it doesn't have any uh, evidence one way to or other for any hypothesis well, yeah. and uh, there there are a lot of cases, though, in which people reported perceiving things in the material world that were later verified to be accurate. And I know Darren interviewed uh, a physician who had a patient who, in card well, the patient was in cardiac arrest. Um, uh, Is this Dr. Chris Yarrington? Yes, and he, and they. You know, they resuscitated the person. He, he, of course, survived and and then reported to uh, Dr. Yarrington that while he was out of his body, he was looking down on the scene in the operating room or the wherever they were resuscitating him, and uh, and he right in front of him, so to speak, were the um, inventory sticker on the lamp of the of the operating room and it was i think chris said or uh yarrington said it was like 12 digits or something like that and yep, the guy years. reported to him and a nurse and then back to him again every time they'd ask him he'd say the same 12 digits and so finally um curiosity got the better of them and they went and checked and it was correct mm -hmm. and and there were some there were some um possible alternate explanations but not very viable ones that i don't think for example um at the beginning of the 
procedure where they're resuscitating, they turn the lamps upside down in order to do some, I don't know, sterilization or put something in. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so for about 30 seconds, he said, those stickers were facing, you know, where the patient was lying like this, but, but they were in the process of resuscitating him. He, he couldn't remember, that is the doctor, whether he had already taped the patient's eyelids shut or not. And, you know, because he wasn't trying to do a research study. He was trying to save this guy's life and all this kind of unfolded yeah. after the fact. And so, um, so you can't entirely, but like how, put yourself in that situation. If you're, you know, in cardiac arrest and you're being resuscitated and you're, I, eyes flip open for 30 seconds and there's some kind of um, uh, sticker on a lamp, you know, that I'm sure was still a couple few feet away. Mm. How likely are you to remember those, it, to even think about that and, you know, focus on that? But he said in the out-of-body state, he was there, he was watching for a long time and he could read everything that had happened the entire time in the mm -hmm. in the operating room so he was seeing those stickers and really you know thinking about them and concentrating so all that to say that that's just one example, one example. Of, are you familiar uh, with uh, does the does the name ed dames major ed dames ring a bell no major ed james he um and this is all um, supposedly because he used to be on a television or excuse me, a radio show by art this bell is, called coast to coast this is anec anecdotal oh yeah it? art bell uh -huh. yeah anecdotal yeah he was um he was supposedly what's called doing uh, remote viewing in a project called stargate yeah. project oh yeah uh, he claimed to be oh, yeah, trained stargate, by Ingo, 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 ingo swan's ingo protege swan. and so this is kind of what they were trying to do with the whole um out of body type experience it's very similar they didn't necessarily call it that but that's what basically remote viewing was trying to get intel on uh, enemy uh, combatants and enemy intelligence that yielded no results whatsoever mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but uh i mean i think there was probably a lot of interest in a lot of these topics especially in the 70s and 80s and the, during the cold war because any kind of psyop anything advantage wise we had to uh to determine whether we can gain some military advantage uh, they looked into and they didn't find anything useful. So there are always going to be anecdotal evidence that, hey, you know, they had some kind of intel, they acted upon it, got maybe close. Um, in this case, like you said, they, that there's a number that they saw. But uh, I'm as somebody who were, you know, to be saying that this is actually an actual event, there would have to be a lot more consistency there uh, to me, right? Uh, but again, we have to we have to go into the presupposition that you're able to perceive things in a way uh, it, that out of body, you wouldn't be having the same filters that we have biologically yeah. speaking. So it, it's kind okay, of a, it kind right. of a catch twenty two, right? You're trying to, to show something that is the case that has verticality, but in order to do so, we have to you know even have the presumption that you're able to do so in an out of body or a near death type experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, and and I've actually asked NDEers, people who've had the material aspect NDE if they believe they could have read or did read, mm -hmm. you know, but, or could have read from that state. And a, a little over 50% said, absolutely, yes. And then some said, maybe, I'm not sure. And some said, I don't think so. But, um, but a little over 50% said they absolutely believe yeah, they could. Words are generally could. distorted so, in those states. Like if you look in a mirror it, in, in an altered state, it looks altered. Words generally look altered. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think most yeah. people have had these kind of experiences say the same thing, that things don't look quite the same. They're slightly altered. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as Jan was saying about um, people that are out of body, when talking to them retrospectively, say they certainly could have, have seen things and could have reported back. And um, in Penny, Tar 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 yeah, Penny Sartori's study, um, what she was saying was uh, she, she was one who put up targets to, to be viewed while the patients are out of body. And when she interviewed one of them later, she asked, did you see this target? And the lady said, no. But she said, to be honest, I was out of my body. I was freaking out a little bit because I was seeing myself dead down there. If I'd have known before I was going under that, you'd set this up, I would have looked for it and let you know. But to be honest, looking around and finding things to remember wasn't really top of my list when I was out of body looking at myself dead. And you, you, you understand that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it's, yeah, so there things, are... 
Yeah, it's, yeah it's, 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 when, it's, when you're in a lucid state, you're like doing, hey, this is really cool. I don't know what the hell is going on here, but I'm just checking it out. <clears throat> you, you, you don't really have your wits about you to kind of go, okay, exactly what I want to do. But sometimes, sometimes you do more than others. But then again, I've never had any. The closest I've ever had, <clears throat> um, I was doing a self-induced lucid state. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was ripped out of my body, thrown on the floor, and I was looking up from my carpet, you know, looking up at my TV. And this was years ago, I mean, back when I was, uh, before I even joined the Navy, so it was my high school years. And, uh, you know, I, I snapped out of it, and I got out of my bed, got on the floor and looked up, and it was pretty much the same perspective. Um, but that can be explained by just, you know, your mind filling in these kind of blanks kind of stuff. But it was something that was very cool. kind of, I was like, wow, this is this is this is cool <laughs> you know that's yeah. um that's one of the points one of your viewers brought up i can't remember who it was on past oh it was in tree fanny saying um isn't it also precisely how a brain is expected to work it often fills in the blanks based on what one knows if one doesn't know about these things in the er then it likely wouldn't create it that's true yeah and th this is why you know these near-death experiences that don't contain a material veridical aspect don't particularly interest me because i can reason myself quite easily into believing that it's hypoxia induced hallucination or a result result of the drugs that are given but when you have these experiences that take place with veridical perception in a time where every understanding we have in neurophysiology will say no experience is possible that's when i begin to get interested because then you have something that shouldn't happen by and also means. when and also uh, yes, and also when people perceive things that could not have been um, guessed. Um, so, for example, um, in the book, The Self Does Not Die, which is a collection of near-death experiences involving uh, apparently non-physical veridical perception that was verified by at least one other person, um, in one case, a woman unexpectedly during surgery went into cardiac arrest, was resuscitated. Um, they finished the surgery. You know, during none of this did she ever regain consciousness or anything. Um, so that she's brought to post op, she regains consciousness. Her physician comes to check on her and she says, I know that I died during the surgery. And he's like, What? And she says, yeah, because I was up above uh, the ceiling and looking down and here's what you were doing. And he's kind of amazed, which, you know, he shouldn't be at this point. <laughs> People should know this happens. But um, anyway, she says, yeah. And I also, because I was above the ceiling, I could, and I could see through the ceiling and I could see through the walls. I could see in the operating room next door that they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished, they put the amputated leg in a yellow plastic bag. And I actually heard this physician interviewed online. And since then, the interview has been taken down. But he said that um, he was like so surprised, like, what is she talking about? And, and he said um, he doesn't know what's going on in the other operating rooms. But at this point, it was a couple of hours later. So we went back to the hospital records and found that, in fact, while he was doing the surgery on her, they were amputating a man's leg in the operating room next door. And because it was a specialized operating room for those kinds of procedures, which weren't, wasn't what he did, he had never been in that OR before. But at that time, two hours later, it happened to be empty. So he went and peeked into the room, and there he saw the yellow plastic bags they used to dispose of amputated body parts. So it's like, how could a patient who's in cardiac arrest know what's going on in the next operating room, except that um, they did report accurately what was happening there, not something that, that they would have known, not something that their own surgeon knew. Um, so that that begins to um, more robustly challenge um, these alternative explanations that this is all, you know, the brain is filling in stuff, the person's yeah. hallucinating, you know. The, yeah. the, the, the most common kind of exp uh, or rebuttal that you hear for things like that is that, well, this is anecdotal. It doesn't have any kind of evidential mm -hmm. value. To me, that doesn't work because these <sighs> cases have been third party verified and documented. Yeah. Yeah. I think as soon as you have 
third party verification and especially as you say the book self does not die which has hundreds or i think over a hundred right, over a hundred cases the english mm-hmm. version over a hundred mm-hmm. cases all of which have been third party verified all of which contain these veridical perceptions i think now you're kind of going beyond the realm of simple anecdotal well, I, I think there's some value to have for yeah. anecdotal evidence sometimes i think people are just too dismissive of it um look yeah. If, yeah. If, if 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 you enter a crime scene and a bunch of witnesses are all saying hey you know this person was uh, wearing a blue t-shirt 99 percent of them but one person said they were wearing a white t-shirt you know the anecdotal evidence is probably going to be for through inductive reasoning it's going to be a suspect with a blue t-shirt there's going to be some commonalities so i don't think dismissing anecdotal evidence offhand is is primarily the way to go i would like to ask my audience though how many of them have had any kind of out of body or um again i don't believe they're actually out of body but lucid type dreaming or, or nd or something like that where like for example like looking down from the ceiling this has happened to me multiple times. I mean, I don't care if anybody believes me. I don't have to convince anybody. I'm not I'm not taking on any kind of burden of persuasion. It makes no difference to me whether they believe it or not. I know it has happened multiple times. I'm able to self-induce it. I can help people do that. So, But does that mean that I'm actually out of my body? Well, I'm not convinced of that, right? I just am convinced of what I know to be the case, which I actually was. So it's a step-by-step process. So I think that because I have actually seen looking down, not necessarily at my body but looking down from like the ceiling or something like that then somebody else has as well and how they fill it in the blanks or how they interpret it uh, might be different um so i don't know whether they were you know out of their bodies i don't know if they actually were looking at some kind of or other or but the possibility certain is clear it rises merely from the fact that yes i've experienced very similar things just not to that degree does that make sense yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't think many people will deny that these experiences happen. Um, if they do, then I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's a pretty silly position to take. That yeah, it's not it's, outright. They don't happen. It's, I mean, it's not. It's not. Is it a real experience? Yes, it's a real experience. But what? Does what's that the cause? Mean? Yeah. What is? What's what is the, the cause? causality of it? Is, sure. Is it? I mean, we've got two possibilities, haven't we? Really, it's either, or you could say many subsets, but generally, it's either a brain-created experience. If you take the position that the brain creates consciousness, which I don't, but is a perfectly valid one. Um, and the other possibility is that it's caused, uh, perhaps even um, influenced by the brain, but ultimately it's kind of a, a separation. It really place. is. Is there something external that, and, that exists there? But, but yeah, exactly. And either of those are perfectly valid positions to take. It's pushed so much now that the brain creates consciousness is kind of a, an understood thing. It's an assumption. There's nothing else, nothing other than that. There's a lot of evidence for it. There's also a lot of evidence now that the brain perhaps works as a receiver or something similar to that from an external force that we don't know, we don't understand. Um, the question is, which is more parsimonious? And it, it depends kind of on your what you class as reasonable evidence and, and the way that you've been brought up. And it, it goes in a lot, a lot of factors. Um, but to me personally, I'm not saying I'm right, um there's it's much more parsimonious to say that the brain seems to act more as a filter because you have all the evidence that you see for a materialist idea that the brain creates consciousness can also be used plus more in my opinion on the brain receiver theory because you can also now explain to a much wider degree these anomalous experiences and the veridical perception that takes place how that would work Nobody knows, and if it is non-physical by definition, how are you going to know? And that, but that's the the question: how how to go about acquiring knowledge about this? So this is why I do like these kinds of studies. People always say, "Why do we have kind of paranormal kind of studies?" And I think that word is awfully mm-hmm. misused uh, because of unfortunately bad actors. Um, you know, do I do I believe the supernatural exists? No, I don't. Do I think it's possible? Yes, that's why I'm not a ontological or metaphysical naturalist. But I think that research under these areas absolutely should be done. I think that even if we don't garnish any information regarding supernatural causation or paranormal uh, stuff, it still, I think, inherently leads to, an even at the worst case, some kind of naturalistic explanation. Yeah. I think even that word paranormal is very misleading because, to me, when something's discovered, it will be natural, just that it hasn't been discovered yet. You know, people always compare or, or separate paranormal or supernatural and undiscovered, unfound natural. To me, it's one and the same thing. Yeah, I, I don't, Once I don't, I don't categorize them that way though. And the reason no. being is because there is preternatural, which I think that's maybe what the term 
better would be used for, for that. But I think supernatural uh, is more effective in a philosophical concept of things that are outside our, our, our experience. Like, for example, even if even if God existed, yes, he would be part of the physical world. He'd be part of this possible ex- extant world that exists, the actualized world. But because he's so far removed from our experiences in any kind of real practical kind of way, that's what we mean, generally speaking in philosophy, what a supernatural causation would be. Something that is so beyond the natural, even though that it exists some, in some capacity in this possible world, it is um, completely different from our normal experiences in, 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 in every capacity, not just like an alien mind or something like that. Yeah. And I think that's not a bad way to look at it if you're looking at a set theory. Yeah, and that's fine. But d- does that mean that it's not part of nature or is it a part of nature that we just simply don't understand yet? Uh, well, when we use the word nature, that's where we're kind of limiting the scope to things that we experience, right? If God, if, for example, if, if some kind of uh, theistic type deity exists outside space time, then that would be completely contrary to what we understand for any understand we have of, of the universe, uh, Mikowski space, uh, even even a kind of a Lorenzian model. So we say, hey, th- we're going we're gonna to categorize this stuff to be so far removed, we're going to call it supernatural. And supernatural causations don't have to have any kind of naturalistic explanations, right? They don't have to say this caused this caused this because uh, mechanisms which we may not be knowing of right now, but we have the ability to learn. Supernatural could be anything, right? I mean, magic would be supernatural, which has no actual ontology and explana- explanations or anything. So what, my, my point is, I think, because I, I think Dr. Holden perfectly stated it earlier, we have to relate these things in words based upon our language and cultures. And there's no way for us to linguistically kind of describe what supernatural would be other than something that is completely removed from our natural experiences. Whether it exists in this possible world or not, to me, it doesn't really, it's not constitutive of something that is supernatural. Well, I, I guess I want to take kind of a position in between or maybe a little closer to Darren in that uh, I prefer the terms material and transmaterial. And um, that uh, I think what you're referring to, Steve, about what we can experience directly is the material world. We're capable of experiencing the material. Um, I also have had transmaterial experiences um, I, I have had an experience of encounter, an encounter with what I perceive to be God in a mystical experience. Um, it was perfectly natural. It was perfectly natural. I don't know how else to say it. It was perfectly natural, um, but it was not material. It was mm-hmm. not of the material world. And mm-hmm. so, um, so I think uh, for me, the words material and transmaterial more clearly help to differentiate. And and in my view, both of them are part of nature. Everything is part of, of um, you know, everything is was, natural. Was this, type, was this a type of uh, theistic type God? No, because I'm not, I'm, well, uh, I'm word. not theistically or, we certainly not religiously affiliated. Um, I'm I'm affiliated with my experiences and and research. So, so, so you would say that <laughs> but, it was some kind of it's some kind of intelligence, but not of what people of a religious nature would yeah. be, be say. Hey, this is this yes. is the Christian God. This is the the Al, uh, yes. Arab God. This is but it's some entity that does exist that is. Uh, and somehow involved in our daily routines has, and somehow I mean the maybe the uh, creation of all things that that kind of intelligence things, in some way. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. There, mm-hmm. There's so many different theories about what one would call God. I mean, you know, yeah, you've got course. the religions that, that that call a God a separate entity who is governing over and has a reward and punishment system. Something I don't believe in it, in at all. In that sense, I'm atheistic. Yeah. Uh, whether you could say I'm I'm a theist because I believe in some sort of some of some intelligence beyond what we currently understand, I I don't know, which is why I find I, I'm so difficult to label myself in. Well, you, you, you don't just, have to. Like I mean, agnostic. a person doesn't have to look. You you can believe supernatural exists and still be an atheist. They're not um, mm. independent of each other. I mean, there are forms of atheism where, like even the International Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, McConkie writes that some people use atheism to mean uh, materialistic, as Dr. Holden pointed out. Right, a materialist that has uh, that's it. There's just 
by, by, by fiat, basically. If you're a materialist, you have to hold there are no gods, there are no, no spirits, there are no dualism. There is nothing re- possible other than what we have physicality for. Yeah. And so that I don't think is a good definition. I don't think that actually works very well. But if you could say, look, I, th- I don't believe in any gods, but I do believe you know, there might be some kind of spiritual aspect of an intelligence that exists. I don't think those are mutually exclusive. And I don't think spiritualism is mutually exclusive from atheism because I'm I we all have experiences that are I believe some of us call spiritual. That doesn't mean something you know supernatural exists or what you described as transmaterial. It just means to me uh, when you have a spiritual experience, it is profound. It is emotional. It um, music to me is spiritual, right? I mean, you hear some songs, and I'm tell- I I relate that as almost a spiritual experience, right? Yeah. Um, and I have no problem with that, but I think a lot of atheists discount those kind of terms right off the bat because they have so many religious overtones. See, to me, and I've just done a, a podcast on this I haven't put up yet. It's effectively me just thinking out loud, but on the difference between religion and spirituality, to me, I would define religion as an organized group who base their lifestyles on morals and guidelines set by um by the founders of the religion or at least the way that their words have been taken and you know through, through the holy books and they take their morality and they they follow their life based on that whereas to me spirituality is more living and just experiencing life without those boundaries and coming to your own kind of understandings based on just being alive and I, yeah i I, I think of similarly i think of religion as this, as social institutions so that is created by humans um and often with reference to spirit a spiritual domain but uh but the religion is essentially a social institution and spirituality for me is about the direct experience of something that is beyond um mere physical mm. and usually these experiences kind of force you into a belief um that these kind of experiences maybe there are some kind of if you want to say paranormal aspect to it because first-hand experience seems to trump everything else when it comes to learning i just want to do correct uh, marie jean who said to deep ashtray that he'd be interested in the research by paul van lommel it's pim van lommel p-i-m he's a dutch cardiologist who wrote uh, an account in the lancet about um non-local consciousness but yeah go, go and look at his his work he did some very interesting things might be worth you think um going back to the near-death experience and looking at some of the skeptical arguments that are put forward to explain it in a materialistic fashion the first one that most people jump to is anoxia which is effectively lack of um, oxygen in the brain while the heart is not pumping. Um, Jen, do you want to say much about that theory? Yeah, just that that there have been a couple of studies in which oxygen level has been assessed while people were being resuscitated from cardiac arrest, and, and they found that there was no relationship between the level of oxygen in the brain in yeah in the bloodstream or in the body um and either the presence or absence of a near-death experience so in other words some people who had very low levels of oxygen some of those had a near-death experience some did not and people who had relatively higher levels of oxygen some had near-death experiences some did not so oxygen level had no relationship so, to the presence or absence of a near-death experience. It just yeah. wasn't related. So no evident correlation there between oxygen level. And, um, and, and the one that relates to that is the amount of CO2 isn't it, in the blood. There was a study mm-hmm. done on and that. I'm not overly familiar same with Same thing. One. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Both, both oxygen and carbon dioxide and other gases were being assessed. Mm-hmm. No relationship. One study that is also widely cited is that of... Olaf Blunk, who stimulated, and it's well um, mentioned by Susan Blackmore, who's a well-known near-death experience um, critic or or skeptic. Um, And their experiment involved electrically stimulating a part of the brain called the temporal parietal junction, the TPJ, which they believe is responsible for kind of creating the mental image and sensation of being within the body. And they believe that 
um, stimulating that part of the brain effectively simulated an out-of-body experience adequately enough to say that the temporal parietal junction some way is involved in the manifestation of out-of-body experience. What's your mm -hmm. take on that one, Doc? Well, two things. One is that, um, yes, I can open up your skull and take an electric prod and touch it and make your arm twitch, you know? Mm. But that's not the same as you going, <laughs> you know? Mm. I know when I'm being, um, you know, manipulated when I haven't intentionally caused the thing versus when I cause it and and it it feels different. But the other main thing is that all of the materialist explanations don't explain how there can be veridical perception, you know, yeah. um, verified, seemingly non-physical and things that people couldn't have, you know, um, deduced or that sort of thing. So, um, so even if um, I, I think that the the brain theory that makes the most sense to me was just um, addressed in an article in the most recent issue of the Journal of Near Death Studies, where the mm -hmm. authors um, Marjorie Willicott and her co-author, whose name I'm blanking on right now, um, looked at research evidence related to psychedelic experiences and meditation. And, and in both cases, the um, DMN, which I'm now blanking on the, um, the, what that acronym stands for, but it's a system within the brain that seems to be related to our sense of ourself. And when that goes offline, but which occurs both with psychedelics and with mystical experiences, but these are people who are still, you know, very much in their bodies. Um, but this, this um, system goes offline and that's, that's correlated with experience, mystical like experiences both in meditation and in psychedelics and what they suggested is that in near-death experiences when the entire brain is offline um, that that would account for why near-death experiences have these mystical features as well i i, I had to google but that it, by the way I, I, <laughs> I i'm fine with google foo uh default mode network is that what you're thinking of Default mode network. Thank you okay. very much. Google Foo for the um, win. I've never heard of that. Yeah, yes, I, I have yes, not either. Great. And I'm I am happy exactly. to admit when something I do not ever heard of before, I'm happy mm. to look it up. And uh, uh, also, just yeah, like yes. like to apologize to Cheshire and anyone else that falls asleep because of my soft voice. I am you do have a very voice. soft, pleasant voice. Um, <laughs> very soothing. That's, yeah, that's very the soothing. Correct. In me. I, 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 I wonder, have you ever had an angry discussion in any debate <laughs> or discussion? Hmm. I, I try to avoid confrontation as much as possible you know with the anxiety and the depression it's it's my heart is very soft um, so let me ask you know i i want to let, let me take this opportunity to say that i have never known someone as open-minded and willing to consider alternative perspectives as darren i just think that you are an exceptional human being in this regard and and it. you you really i i've i've never seen you lose um lose your temper or lose your your sense of i think you you've become impatient and and um uh and um you know clearly disagree with a, a point of view but you you still maintain your um openness and and connectedness to people and it's just i it's just laudable because i'm yeah, not that cool well yeah my my, my <laughs> audience has never ever seen me lose my cool ever no wait <laughs> yeah okay i almost got yeah, that out I with know a for straight a, face I we know actually got really broke character true. there because uh yeah <laughs> it, yeah I, i've been on way too long and have a lot of times lost uh lost my cool uh to say the least and it's usually out of frustration though it really is yeah. dealing with yes. dishonest actors i can disagree with somebody all i want i can we can have diametrically opposing views but when you're dealing with somebody who's not an honest interlocutor that is being dishonest yeah. disingenuous evasive yeah, it can get very frustrating, and I think that's um, I think a lot of people will eventually go, okay, I just I've had enough in there. But let me ask you this, Dr. McCann, because 
one of the hardest problems I have with the psychology, the uh, philosophy of the mind, is basically the the problem not just of hard consciousness, but the, the problem of of having a materialistic or monistic type substance that. If you have a thought, if I have, a, a, I want you to do something, that is merely an abstract thought. And it is very difficult, even for a materialist, to say, how does that thought convey into a, a changing of something in the universe? It has manifested as a thought, but now that thought mechanistically has to be able to, to change something. Because if I say, I want to, you know, take a, a glass of, you know, sip for my water here, I have that thought. How does it actually get changed into an actual action? And for a, for a diehard materialist, that is one of the most difficult questions in the philosophy of mind, I think. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and Absolutely. by the way, I'm not, I'm not a substance dualist. I, I mean, I'm I'm all over the place on that, but it is one of the more difficult questions. Um, and, and I'm fine when people say, "Look, we don't have an answer to that yet." Yeah, and that's I, I agree. We do not have an answer for it, but it is a very very difficult for anybody who just says, "Hey, look, you know, I am a firm materialist." Okay, well, if you're a firm materialist then how does the abstraction become concrete? There has to be a hypostantiation there. And so <laughs> there's a materialist, uh, but you can't, yeah, how does that do that for materialists, right? I mean, they have to say, uh, um, magic? Um, but then that defeats the position. Yeah. So I, I'm open-minded I mean, on that as well. A, a lot of people on the skeptical side always bring forth the quote that extraordinary uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. And yes, fair enough. What's a more extraordinary claim than material non-conscious matter can create an experience actually you know what's funny i i literally recorded uh, at, uh that okay that's sagan's um uh statement right i mean he, he didn't he didn't actually say it outright uh it would actually well he he did but he modified it by leibniz and uh Truzio. but uh, basically we i just recorded something for agree to argue on extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and why i think it's a very bad aphorism and why mm -hmm. both atheists and theists probably shouldn't use it uh, it is just a rule of thumb, but there's many, many problems on that. So I will, I will plug my other channel real quick, which is not really my channel, but I'm on there with Dr. Fazrana. Uh, if you're looking for uh, kind of these kind of topics relating to uh, me and a, a theist having these conversations, then go check out Agree to Argue because we will, we will have that video up soon. It's called The Good, The Bad, and The Huh that we do a little segment on. And I think that argument for ECRI, uh, it, I think it's bad. I think it's bad. I really do. And I think a lot of atheists just kind of dismiss uh, things by fiat by saying hey, extraordinary claims, but then when you kind of ask them, well, what do you mean by an extraordinary claim? You kind of find out claims are claims, evidence is evidence. Uh, anytime you kind of involve any kind of subjectivity into an objective scientific framework, you're going to have a problem because now you 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 you're not being objective. And so, uh, yeah, I would disagree with you, Darren, on that. That uh, ECRI is probably a model people should use. I think if people really looked into it more, they'd probably go, eh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't use it as that much. But that's my side note for the for the day. Sorry. Sure. Um, there was a question from a while ago that I, I tried to get in as soon as I could um, from um, Feline again. It was regarding the idea of the phantom limb phenomena, where an amputated limb can often be felt as if it was still there by the person and yet not. And it was, I believe the question was in relation to the, of the Olaf Blanke idea of um, your, your brain effectively being able to create this sensation of, of, being out of body or connected in yeah. some sort, of, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, explained, Darren. I do, <laughs> and I think I think that's a it's a good um, possibility that there's some kind of relationship there, and it, that it is phantom, meaning not not actual, um, and and then for me that brings us back to um, the phenomenon of veridical perception which in which something um seemingly non-physical actually is perceived accurately um so um so that it's it's possible that that what blanc was uh finding was something related to the phantom limb phenomenon yeah it's an interesting interesting idea it is. Uh, Deep Ashtray says, um, oh, by the way, Deep, you mentioned about the quantum stuff with IP. I've, I've had a chat with him. He's a good, good guy. He knows what he's talking about. I like Go IP. and watch that one yeah. if you like. It's, it might be an interesting one. He, yeah, he yeah. does his research. Jeez. Um, uh, Deep Ashtray says, meditation has a lot to do with moving your thought process to a different part of the brain. Sorry. 
<laughs> the other one mentioned um, meditation as well. Here we go. What Darren said was saying about the lack of oxygen to the brain could be something in med uh, because in meditation you slow your heart rate right down. So it could be something in that. Yeah, so, and um, I, you know, I I don't know whether anyone has actually measured oxygen levels during people's like if people have mystical experiences during meditation for example um but i do know as going back to that other research that there has been research on the default mode network being deactivated that seemingly what what people actually are training themselves to do unknowingly during meditation is to deactivate the default mode network and um, and whether there's any difference in oxygen level when the DMN is online or offline, I I don't know. But um, but the the bottom line seems to be the this kind of neural um, alteration. Mm. The question then, of course, is that. If, if you have the assumption that the brain is the producer of consciousness, you will use that as kind of, well, we see that this brain activity is, is reduced or, or heightened during this experience. So therefore this is where in the brain it takes place. And the question is the standard correlation causation question, because all any study of the brain and the activity can show is correlation. At best. And the question is, you know, do, yes, this part of the brain lights up, but that doesn't necessarily show that that's the causal factor. Exactly. Yeah, no, I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially if you consider the possibility that the brain is a filter, then it would equally make sense that that, that part of the brain is operational or not operational related to this particular experience. But again, um, the, if the cause is is C, not, you know, not, not A, um, then uh, it, um, I lost my train of thought. I do want to emphasize what you said, though, before, Darren, about I, I have never, I have found a lot of phenomena that can be explained by both the theory that the brain causes consciousness and the theory that the brain is a filter of consciousness, that consciousness actually has its origin outside the brain and is somehow filtered through the brain. So this is the same, you know, when we're talking about electrostimulation of the brain or just about, you know, most of the phenomena that we, that we know can be understood either this through this or this equally well and and there's no basis to privilege one of those views over the other yeah, right. however there is this category of phenomena that can be explained by the filter theory that can't be explained by the brain produces consciousness theory i have never found a phenomenon that could be explained by the the brain produces consciousness theory that couldn't be explained by the filter theory. So you were talking before about parsimoniousness, and I also want to bring in comprehensiveness, that, that the brain produces consciousness is not as comprehensive an explanatory model as the filter model. And, um, and particularly in light of at least what so far for me has been a fact that I don't know of a phenomenon that can be explained by the brain produces that can't be explained by the filter. What would, you, what would you place so this, this one? one oh, I'm sorry. What, what would you place, for example, the phenomenon of? Uh, I'm, I'm, I tend to what's called color or realism. Uh, I don't think colors actually have ontology at all. I think that there's purely a phenomenon with that exists in the brain. Because, I mean, we can see colors when we sleep, so there's this obviously nothing relating to any kind of jewels or energy deposited on the retina. The brain's not processing anything. It's not it has anything to do with photons or, or physics. It is a strictly phenomenological uh, thing that exists mm -hmm. solely within the mind. So the color mm -hmm. that we experience, the actual experience, the qua or qualia of the sense that, and I think that you're right in, as far as a filter, but I would put it more as we are a biological entity that has been through millions of years of evolution to 
filtered to how we perceive our universe. If things have, had evolved differently, we'd perceive our universe in a very different way. And so what the actual state of affairs are in the universe, we, we never have epistemic access to. I think it's completely forever outside of our understanding and will always be just because we have to, we have to work with the hard wire when we've got. So when we experience a color, and I do mean the actual phenomenon itself, which of your which of those two theories you think better explain that uh, the the brain is produces a consciousness or somehow the consciousness exists and then the brain kind of filters that as a receiver of some kind? Well, um, I th again I think that it can be explained through either either theory. Mm -hmm. um, one of the kind of interesting things from near death experiences is it's very common for people to report that in the transmaterial domain in particular, they perceived color that doesn't exist in the material world or that they at least never seen in mm -hmm. the material world. And they also report hearing sounds that uh, are different from anything they've ever experienced in the material world. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. So it, that, that is really interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah, and and so that's kind of it is really interesting. Like, how can we perceive something in an altered state of consciousness that exceeds anything we could have perceived in the physical world? Yeah, well, like, well, like or, the color pink doesn't even have a wavelength associated to it. The color pink is phenomenological, uh, strictly because it it just doesn't have any any relationship to wavelength or anything like that. And I think that that is mm -hmm. indicative of, yes, we know the spectrum. We know that there are certain only quantized levels within the electromagnetic spectrum for visible light. However, we still see things that maybe don't necessarily exist in the electromagnetic spectrum. And I think to say that the brain is capable of doing that is a remarkable thing in and of itself, regardless of if it's... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just... It, yeah. And I'm fascinated by that stuff. I really am. I think, it, I think it is worthy of exploration, uh, definitely worth studying. I think a lot of people do kind of uh, pass it off by fiat way too quickly. But uh, I think if we can ever resolve some of these answers, it would just be amazing, not just for neuroscience, but philosophy as well, which is the kind of the area I like. Yeah. Just a deep ashtray just quickly asked, what's the mechanism? Just could you clarify the mechanism for what? I mean, we said many things. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And um, Macabre uh, Malefica says, I demonstrated that by correcting an imbalance of glutamate in the nucleus acu accumbens, okay, can, that's right. A big okay. compulsive drug seeking behavior. Where is the filter? This conversation requires a neuroscience. Yeah. I um, can only bring a couple of experts it, on at well, a time, Macabre. Come on. <laughs> Wait, don't try and take credit for well, arranging this. Yeah, actually, this was, you know, by the way, I never even got to that. This, I want to thank Darren, because uh, Darren arranged all this stuff. I'll get into all that afterwards, but this was actually <laughs> Darren's, uh, Darren's big thing. And uh, it's in several months in the works, actually. But go ahead, Dr. Holden. I apologize. Well, um, I think that this, this is exactly, I think it exactly illustrates the, the possibility that of uh, the, the filter that if I change the nature of the filter, then I'm going to change the nature of what I experience. Absolutely. And so if I cor correct some kind of quote imbalance, which just means that it was functioning different than most people's does, we, I'm not sure that that's necessarily, you know, it's like there's an inherent value judgment about that. But if I change the the um, configuration somehow chemically and change the um, the experience. I I am changing the filter the um, through which what what at least what near death experiencers report is that when during the near death experience their consciousness is expanded. They have capacities, um, perceptual capacities that they don't have in the physical world or in physical existence and they really experience when they re-enter the body they experience those abilities getting you know like diminished again so that they can like fit back in it's you know like squeezing your foot into a a, a shoe that's smaller and they often after their ndes have this sense of um that their consciousness somehow is larger than it was before. Um, so, so the point is that the 
that the um, they, their perception is that the brain definitely is a filter um, that um, that reduces uh, what we actually are capable of perceiving. Um, and you know, and for me, a big question, a big philosophical question, is why? Why are we? If if all of this is the case, why are we embodied in these limited bodies, carrying out this you know horrendous drama that involves a lot of suffering and all of that? Like, what's the point? What's the end purpose? Oh, those, yeah. that's that's another purpose? fifty videos just dedicated that's, to that exactly. question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, just well, I, I can tell you at least what near-death experiencers tend to say, and I'm not, you know, not every NDE is going to say this, but most will say that they learned in their NDE that we are here on Earth, although they don't explain ultimately why, um, that we're here to advance in our capacity to love and to learn. So it's all about loving and learning, and that somehow... Um, earthly existence is an opportunity to um, advance spiritually and um, and bring lessons that we're able to learn only in the in these dimensions with us when we return, as Andy Ears would say, to um, the dimension from which we came. And so, um, at least it provides. An answer, you know, whether you buy it or not is mm. very much, you know. And I'll just say Deep Ashray did um, expand on his questions to the, the okay. mechanism. And I, essentially, it was what I, I think I thought you were saying is that what's the mechanism then for the, um, if, if what we call God or consciousness exists, what's the mechanism for that existing? How does it exist outside of the physical brain? And the answer I can give you is that's why we're studying it. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. We haven't got yeah. a clue don't pretend no. to mm -mm. but that's the whole reason we're studying it but it, the, the point is the experiences that people have and the veridical aspect of it especially seems to indicate that there is something at least and i think it would be incredibly arrogant to say that we understand a tiny percentage of what existence really is that there is something we don't understand beyond the physical brain what that is we don't know how that interacts we don't know but it's worthy enough of investigation. Um, and also, uh, Macabre Malefica, sorry, uh, comes back again on the um, idea. He says, but compulsive behavior can be contextualized as a broken circuit between your hipp hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Broken memory, um, correcting glutama glutamatergic <laughs> dysregulation reduces compulsive dis behavior. Change the filter, change the, the yeah. output behavior. A yeah. good analogy for that is um, if we take one of the examples, very crude example of, of evidence used for a physical means, if you bash your head with a hammer, you're going to lose consciousness or you're going to become incredibly fuzzy in your consciousness. If you play a radio, which we know by definition is a receiver of a signal, which is then, um, which is then displayed as, as sound, you go and whack that as hard as you can with a hammer, one of two things will happen. The sound will stop completely and all the lights will go off or the sound will become extremely distorted. That's kind of what we're saying about the filter theory of the brain. It's, it's not necessarily the producer of consciousness, but it is important in filtering consciousness into an experience that we understand it. Yeah, the processing yeah. of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know we can change that filter. We can alter it. We can modify it. I mean, there's been experience where, experiments where they would have people wear glasses that turned everything you know, upside down. But you wear that glasses yeah. enough, yeah, it flips it back up. The brain knows, for whatever reason, it, it wants to apprehend the universe. That's the whole, the, mm -hmm. the mind apprehends the universe. And whether we understand that right now or not, uh, doesn't change the fact that we've seen the mind do this. And that, that's one just, of the reasons why people explain wanna... Study these things. Go I just want to. I just want to point out that you use the word brain and mind interchangeably. Yeah. You first said the brain wants to apprehend the universe, then you said the mind does. And I that, think there's the, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, the mind. I think very, the, I, yeah, the, the mind wants to apprehend the. I was just saying the yeah, mind yeah. wants to apprehend. I think but we, I do think been, the brain is the hard mechanism 
by which that happens. Mm -hmm. I do think I, I personally yeah. at right now I do tend to the mind is an emergent function of the brain, mm -hmm. right? And I think the brain is a physical mm -hmm. substrate. The mind is emergence. But again, that is just a philosophical position that has can be changed on the fly, you know. Yeah, and it shows you how I mean, despite the fact that the mind, the brain creates the mind, is an assumption. Yes, it's so well fed into our culture that you can you kind of use them interchangeably without really thinking. Yes, about you're it. right. Absolutely, and, good catch. Mm -hmm. um, Crystal Ignition says a counter I've heard before is where doctors would place objects in the room that the patients would not see but would see if they were floating above, like a matchbox in the closet. We've already yeah the targets through that one a, a bit a bit back. Just go back and watch kind of the start of the video once it's done. You'll we, we go through all that and there's a reasonable explanation as to why usually it's down to sample size and people not being aware they're supposed to look for things when they're out of body. But yeah, it's a good question. It's always worth looking into it. I think that, that's it for questions so far. And in fact, people per interested in this, uh, in the studies that have been done on this, uh, in the book, The Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, I wrote a chapter on apparently non-physical veridical perception. And it includes uh, a review of each of the, at that time, five studies. Since then, Parnia has done his AWARE study. So there's now a sixth. Um, and uh, and you can see how each study was done and um, and what the yeah, and as Darren said that the results came up nil and then a, a thorough discussion about all the factors um, to account for why it's so challenging um, to to capture this phenomenon of vertical perception under controlled circumstances. It's really challenging. Mm. And I mean, the near-death experience, mustn't forget, is one aspect of the idea of survival, which is kind of my main, my main area of research. It's survival after death, or what death even means. Um, and there are so many different phenomena mm -hmm. that you, you, can, you can always sorry, explain away the near-death no, no, experience no. if you can. And it'd be very difficult to, as we've tried to explain in this last two hours or so. But... Um, when it's taken collectively, all these experiences, that's where the evidence really comes from. And, and there's so many people, especially online, that will say there's no evidence of life after death. It's not true. <laughs> it really it is not true. Mm -hmm. What they mean is they've never looked for it or they've never seen anything mm -hmm. that convinces them. You go mm -hmm. in very, with an open mind and being very kind of, have an interest in it. You'll find that there's an incredible amount of evidence that you just wouldn't think of looking for, because why would you? Yeah, it'd also but be like amazing. if somebody said, look, there's there's no evidence of lucid dreaming. Well, I know, I know firsthand that is not the case. I mean, mm -hmm. people have studied this. Mm -hmm. Scientists have recognized it now. I mean, yes. but, yeah, while, but at some point they yes. probably would have said, you know, there's no evidence of lucid dreaming. And scientists go, yeah, that they don't exist. But once scientists oh. recognize that they, they, people do do this, they have actually sleep studies on it. Yeah, I'll, that's an interesting, right. An interesting story that Dr. Harold Valak told me um, he's the author of a, of a document called the Galileo Commission Report, which is part of the Scientific Medical Network, which is something, again, worth looking at because it highlights all the assumptions in science and why they kind of don't really work, as well as other things like um, the statistical significance of psi experiments, but that's another thing. But yeah, the Galileo Commission Report is worth looking. But he, he was telling me a very interesting idea of how the scientific community really works because... According to him, and I don't know if this is 100% true, but taking it from, from him, I'd assume it must be. A long time ago, before the heart was realized as a pump, people thought it acted as a, as a, convention, a convection heater. And because of this strong assumption, nobody, when they were listening to the heart, when they decided it must be maybe a pump, no one could hear the heartbeat. They couldn't feel the heartbeat. They couldn't hear the heartbeat because they were so sure that it wasn't a pump that they couldn't actually hear the heartbeat. And it was only when that idea was pushed more and more that people actually started to be able to detect that heartbeat and actually feel it. And it's, it seems amazing that an idea can be so strong that it seems to lose your ability to, to sense things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how true that is, but from Dr. Harold Valak, I'd assume that there is reasonable truth in it tom 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 i think ndes are a product of our brain sorry yeah they may well be i don't think they are but it depends on your take of the evidence mm -hmm. 
And Leah, um, too. You, what you just described, Darren, reminds me of the uh, research that I know has been done in which um, indigenous, some indigenous people cannot perceive a photograph. The, the idea of a three-dimensional um, world being repre represented on a two-dimensional object, it just doesn't compute. Oh, it, so, it took me. Uh, it took me a long time to actually finally see those images. <laughs> it's, it's, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and the first time you do, uh, the first time you actually see one of those three dimensional images in a two dimensional representation, and you actually see the full image, you're like, "Wow, it, it really does." But it's really difficult to get your brain to do that because the brain's not used to looking at things like that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it it really is interesting how our expectations and our experiences can can in the material domain can limit our capacity to perceive. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a good, good example in the chat from Leo Phyllis. There's near-death experiences are emphasized a product of physical brain full stop. Now that Leo Phyllis is what you'd call an opinion. That's not science. There is, you know, a lot of evidence to suggest the contrary, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're you're entitled to your opinion. That's fine, but yeah, it's it's actually an unknown in both philosophy and science. It is completely unknown. Yeah, yeah. It's, I would say and it's to, unknown. And you know, to state something as emphatically as that with emphasis doesn't. Yeah. Now we could all say, sense. hey, it is a fact that everybody uh, has a has a uh, brain uh, if they're conscious, and, and 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 you know, there's there's a light of what they would call. Um, um, what do they call it? I forget. Uh, this uh, brain reactivity. Then the, obviously we can probably say there's a mind, but we all agree that we have to have a mind. Which means we all have to have a brain. I just did it again. As you pointed out, we use these terms often interchangeably. We shouldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we all have to have a physical brain in order to have life. That is something that is a fact, biologically speaking, mm -hmm. philosophically speaking. Those are the things where we can say full stop. But I think when you're dealing with things, dealing with the philosophy of mind, we don't have our we don't have a clue. I mean, it's just, we don't know. I mean, we're just mm -hmm. guessing and we're trying to figure it out. And so I don't think it makes sense to say, hey, look, the, 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 the mind is strictly, you know, some kind of a function of the brain. Uh, we, we, sure you can go as that, as a, as a precept, but I would not state it as some kind of just demonstrated fact. No. And here, here's another kind of mysterious thing. Um, that we haven't touched on yet, and that's uh, electromagnetic after effects of near-death experiences. Mm. Yeah. So there's this phenomenon where uh, origin originally in the early near-death research, people were reporting, you know, anecdotally that um, near-death experiences would report like walking down the street of, of past several streetlights. And as they would approach each streetlight, it would go out. And when they pass it, it would go back on. And then the next one would go out and that sort of thing. If you've ever seen the Jimmy Durante, the old, if you, that's probably too old for I a lot of Durante listeners. But, <laughs> yeah. And well, he used to do a thing, yeah. an entry Hot thing where it, what used to say? happen. So, pardon? What did Durante used to say? A ha cha 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 or something. Ha -cha -cha. Yeah, ha -cha -cha. yeah, ha -cha -cha. yeah. <laughs> Boy, I'm giving away so, my I'm giving away yeah, my so uh, my age here. Never mind. Your age, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, right. So um, they also reported that um, mechanical or electrical things malfunctioned in their presence. Computers would crash. Um, the, a lot of near death experiencers can't wear a wristwatch because the battery dies within a week or two, they'll put in a new battery, it dies within a week or two, and finally they just give up. And they, they didn't have these problems before their NDE, they only had them after. So there have been two studies now, two independent studies, questioning people who had a close brush with death where they didn't remember a near-death experience, a close brush with death where they did remember a near-death experience, and then no, didn't remember ever having come close to death and answer questions about how often electrical things malfunction in their presence. And so if you think about the people who have never come close to death, they report malfunctions at this level. Doesn't, you know, just a few mm -hmm. every once in a while. 
if you've come close to death without an NDE, it bumps up a little bit, but not significantly, not statistically significantly. If you had an NDE, it's like this. There's a statistical, statistically significant increase mm. in malfunction. And, um, and so it's just kind of an interesting mystery about how having had this experience of consciousness functioning apart from the physical body and then returning to the physical body, that there is some kind of energetic emanation of some kind that seems to interfere electrically um, around the person. I remember a gal I interviewed one time and, um, and uh, she was saying, oh, this explains, she was living with her boyfriend, they got a new TV. And, and he would complain that whenever she was in the room, the TV volume would go up and down, it would switch channels, and nobody was touching the remote. And he said, it only happens when you're in the room. Well, yeah, because she's a near-death experiencer. That's what happens with a lot of ND ears. So what is going on there? You know, we just, we don't know. But we know that it happens. We don't know what the mechanism is or the, you know, how it happens. Mm. Can, can but I, I, there's something physical yeah. that's manifesting from an experience, from a phenomenological experience. Yeah, can I, can I take what Leo said? Can I, can I address that real quick? Yeah, sure. I, know, I know you yes, want to. You're biting at the, you're biting at the yeah. bit, too. I know you are. Yeah. Uh, but but Leo said, I, and I think this is what I would characterize was called an argument to ignorance. Um, That's a good point. And I and I love Leo. No, get me wrong. Uh, but Leo, he says uh, there's no study that concludes these experiences aren't natural processes. There's no study that concludes quote these experiences aren't natural processes of the brain. There are also no studies that conclude that aliens do not exist or that they do exist. These are unknowns, right? And so when we when a lot of these studies, you will act, they actually will say we don't know. We don't have an answer. So we wouldn't have an expectation to say these experiences are not natural processes of the brain. That's not, the, that's not the point. The point is that there are certain things that are anomalous that requires further investigation. But when you say something along the lines of like, oh, aliens do not exist full stop, why? Well, because no, no study has ever concluded that aliens exist. Well, that's an, by definition an argument from ignorance. Hmm. Aaron, did you want to touch on that? I was going to just say, you know, scientific method is effectively trying to prove something wrong. Uh, there aren't peer-reviewed studies on aliens. Are there? I don't know. But there certainly are on near-death experiences and reasonable ones. I mean, Dr. Jan here is a, um, you've, you've been specially awarded, haven't you, for your research activities in mm -hmm. an N N1, R1, R something, university, which is the highest level of, um, of research university. So I saw your comment comparing us to creationists earlier. We're certainly not in that spectrum. Um, but you know, Leo, that, that, that's just that sort of definite statement is completely the opposite of what science is. And it's, it's really not helpful. And you see it a, a lot amongst those who believe honestly, that what they're doing is critical thinking. And I've been accused many times of not showing critical thinking. I can assure you that I do. Mm. Every possible I, I try to be as objective as possible and I give, I give principal yeah. charity, um, and, mm -hmm. And you, Those, you do as well, and I've noticed that. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to have you know a longer conversation. We've talked in the past, but uh, you know I noted about you. You do really want to, to critically analyze things, and you want to know what the actual verticality is. You want to know what the truth is. Right. And I think yeah. that's important. I mean, the, the thing about it's good to be skeptical, right? And the problem I find, especially with the online louder skeptics, is they are very skeptical of any idea that goes against what they believe they're not so good at being skeptical that perhaps they are incorrect but that's so, not really skepticism i mean it's certainly no, not in any not. philosophical sense but that that's that to not. me is just but, uh, a hyper doubt but the point is is that there are so many of these skeptics online that people follow and they therefore believe that they themselves are skeptical because they do the same things that these other guys do but that unfortunately you've been you've had a shield covered over your eyes you know because that isn't skepticism that's mm -hmm. just non-practical that's not how science works yeah do you remember very, back, do you remember yeah. back when the, about the virtue of doubt people were trying to say that doubt is a virtue and i was giving much pushback to various communities on that because they didn't understand one what a virtue was in any kind of real sense in virtue ethics or any kind of aristotelian sense but 
a virtue is something that you want to always try to you know uh, aspire to and doubt is not doubt, doubt is a tool don't get me wrong doubt can be useful but doubt can actually be detrimental as well and i think a lot of the people on some of these communities that are trying to promote their brand of skepticism tm uh do not really get that they really think that just oh i doubt this or i don't believe you without sufficient evidence is what skept actual skepticism is about it's not um sure it's health it's, it's definitely healthy not to take anything at face value Look, if, you know, if Darren says, hey, Steve, I, you know, I was abducted by aliens last night. I'm like, oh, really? Um, I, yeah, I'm not quite convinced of this. Let's talk about it, right? That's, is a, that's, a, healthy, that's a healthy thing. There's, but this is called ordinary doubt, right? And so I think a lot of people just mistake ordinary doubt that most rational people should have with this weird narrative, oh, I'm being skeptical. Well, no, you're not when you people uh, be so dis dismissive by fiat. Uh, and then they're not really trying to even incorporate anything. Uh, that could any ever ever change their mm. paradigmatic thinking, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When I when I hear someone be that adamant about their opinion, um, I wonder how much they've actually looked at the evidence, mm. and and um, and it would be different for someone who's looked at the evidence and can really account for it through materialist, a materialist explanation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, most of the people, not, not all, but most of the people I know who have looked at, at the evidence critically have come pretty much to the place that Darren is at, which is uh, tending to believe that there is, um, that consciousness func is essentially not seated in the brain that um, there is survival, that there was existence of consciousness prior to birth, and it will continue to exist after our physical death. Um, and uh, as is typical of people who have reached the um, most advanced level of um, uh, um, Critical thinking. I'm think there's a there's a specific reflective judgment. Darren is saying, you know, I'm still open to other, you know, to new information. But this is based on everything I know. I, I don't know if how many of y'all are familiar with reflective judgment theory. Uh, this is Kitchener and King's um, decades of research about how people come to um, their opinions on uh, what are um, ambiguous problems, problems that don't, that can't just be answered with some, you know, factual information, like, um, you know, is abortion right? And is there a survival of consciousness after death? And, and those kinds of um, things. And they found that people um, go through a developmental sequence and their first position is what they call non-reflective or pre-reflective. And, um, and that is that they uh, have attached themselves to some expert, whether it's a book, a person, or some combination of a external authority who has, has voiced a particular opinion and they attach themselves to that. And so it's like they haven't considered the alternatives yet. And then the next level is where they've begun to look at the alternatives and they see that, oh, wait a minute, there are valid points of view over here that are different and this one's different and this one's different. So they're in this quasi-reflective, they've started really looking at the evidence and finding that there is more than one valid point of view. Um, but uh, they're often, um, lost in a mire of relativism because they haven't yet learned how to privilege some of the, you know, some evidence is better than other. And, um, and that even something that can look good at first, when you look at it more carefully, it's like, mm, maybe not so much. And so, um, so the quasi-reflective people see um, the validity of different points of view, but they haven't yet evaluated the evidence enough to privilege some of some of those uh, some of the that evidence over others. At the most advanced level, I guess, um, 
is reflective judgment where the person has evaluated all the evidence and then they and and they have privilege some seeing some having better um, value than mm -hmm. other and come to what I like to call your current best answer and and the difference between that one answer and the first answer, which was pre-reflective, is having looked at all that evidence and weighed it and come to this position, and plus the fact that the pre-reflective position is staunch. You know, it's a, it's a statement in capital letters that excludes any other point of view. The current best answer is a, this is where I'm at right now based on everything I know. And I might change my mind as more evidence comes in. So it's a, it's a somewhat more fluid. So it's, it's solid, but still mm -hmm. um, changeable. Yeah. The, and the, so, um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I Go ahead. No, no, by all means, please. I, I, um, uh, uh, yeah. What you're saying is very, oh. very, very reminiscent of epistemological considerations for how we determine knowledge. Dewey would, would be a, a big part of that kind of a, paradigm where you, you, you be, for example, on certain stages of epistemological certainty, some people say, well, to have knowledge, you have to have epistemic certainty. But of course, most people go what's called a weak case of knowledge that doesn't require certainty. So when we reflect upon how we formulate our beliefs, that goes very much into, I think, what you're kind of talking about. It, it was, was it uh, uh, Kitchener? Kitchener. It's Kitchener. Kitchener, yeah. Okay. So so I, 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 I'm not the exact term you're from, you're, you're, you said it, I'm not familiar with, but it sounds exactly like what I would say relating to how we make our decisions and how do we come across our belief formalizations. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so it can be helpful in um, hearing people's points of view to, um, to be able to understand where they're coming from in terms of their level of reflective judgment. And, um, and, and as Darren said, there's a great deal of evidence from other areas. In fact, I believe that near-death experiences alone do not provide evidence of survival of consciousness after death because everybody who reports a near-death experience didn't ever stay dead. And we don't know what happens when you stay dead. From a purely scientific point of view, um, NDEers cannot tell us what happens when you stay dead. Maybe there's some temporary something somehow that then fizzles out. We, don't, we can't tell from NDEs. But if you also look at the convergence of evidence from research, on things like past life memories, um, mediumship, and what little research there is on after death communication um, right now, um, it it points more solidly towards survival. See, of consciousness. I, I would I would love to have a follow up on that one day. I I, I will tell you, I am very anti mediumship. Um, I I actually a lot of people are. Yeah, I, I'm straight up anti mediumship. Um, but I but again. After, after looking at a lot of things and, and not just, you know, saying, hey, I just by fiat say it's wrong. I actually have looked at, you know, countless hours of footage from many mediums over the years. Sylvia Brown yeah. and a long island medium, Darren, uh, uh, Darren Edwards, who's actually a very good one, but he does it in a very scientific way, right? He actually explains why some of these things it seem like they're like actually – mediumships when they're not but I, I think that to me i don't think mediums exist matter of fact i will say mediums i think are frauds basically but i think that's a, a lot, huge different topic yeah. yeah a lot a lot of them are well there have there have been studies done most notable one by julie byershell of the winbridge institute that have been double triple quad quintuple whatever blinded which mm -hmm. still yielded positive results i don't know about mediumship i've been to a few and i've heard enough anecdotes from people i know and people that i've, I've seen where the accuracy was such that you really do need to 
consider there's well, no Well, I can tell you this. If there is a such thing as a medium or something that does communicate with some kind of uh, consciousness that lives on after death, which, by the way, is a presupposition that, that it is a consciousness that we're talking to that is after death, whether it just yeah. never oh, had yeah. any kind of yeah. existence. But sure. But I, I will definitely say without equivocation that any medium that's ever been on any kind of TV or any kind of uh, show or anything like that, I, I'm absolutely convinced every one of them is a fraud. Mm. Yeah, I don't. I don't tend to base my opinions on people who've been on TV. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I base no. them on. No. I base them on research, as as Darren said. Um, the Winbridge Institute has they've conducted some really careful investigations, and then you know, as Darren mentioned earlier, and we maybe should shine a little bit more light on this. Experience is everything. Um, I until I had experiences of mediumship, I'm not talking about going to a medium. I'm talking about something happened with me that I was the medium mm. and I didn't have any idea what the image that I was getting meant. But when I conveyed it to the person for whom it was se seemingly intended, they burst into tears and explained the meaning of it. And um, and that uh, experience was very evidential for me. Um, I wasn't seeking it. It's what I call spontaneous mediumship, where it happens uninvited, unexpected, unanticipated, and um, and so. But it opened the door for me to consider um, that uh, that the phenomenon could be genuine in some cases. And uh, and I certainly don't disagree that there are people who um, are um, frauds, and and that even people who have some abilities, the abilities are not. Uh, you just can't turn it on and off. And uh, but they may feel pressured, so sometimes they may use um, strategies other than um, genuine communication to get what they're getting. So, um, so, and, and I think just to step back a little bit, this thing of direct experience is really important. You know, Ken Wilbur talks about levels of development and he um, says that the first seven years we're in the pre-personal mode where we're, um, knowledge is acquired purely through the senses. And then around age seven, we develop the capacity to reason so between seven and at least age 21, we're in the personal domain and rationality dominates and the ability to think abstractly and so forth. And then beginning around age 21, but for some people it never happens, um, is the uh, potential to move into the trans uh, personal domain. And that, uh, in that domain, knowledge is transrational. And um, for people who've never experienced that, they just can't get it. It's like trying to ask a three-year-old to reason. They just can't do it. And so, um, so having experience in the transrational domain, to me, seems like a big factor. It, in my experience, it's been a big factor in a person's even openness to consider um, that such a domain even exists. Absolutely. And certainly we get lots of cases of, especially I love the cases of physicians who were just schooled and completely immersed in materialist philosophy until they had a near-death experience. And I'll never forget when Evan Alexander spoke the first time publicly about his near-death experience. I happened mm -hmm. to be there. And he said, you know, here I am, this Harvard neurosurgeon with all these publications. And before my NDE, I thought I knew pretty much everything there was to know about um, the brain and consciousness. Now I take all that knowledge and it's this much in a vast universe. Mm -hmm. And my near-death experience opened me to that. I never would have dreamed it. And so... Um, so I, experience is really important, and I don't know what to do about that. The fact that, you know, even openness to the topic is dependent on experience, and experience, you know, is it's outside of my control to yeah. make happen. Yeah. 
Dr. Ab Alexander's one I spoke with as well, and, and Leo's just on cue there with his old oh God, Ibn Alexander is a fraud. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I've spoken so to So again, Ibn, you know, I, you know, I really invite those of you who think that oh, to um, access the Journal of Near-Death Studies. And I don't have the, the volume and, and all that, but um, I can get it and, and convey it if, if, if anybody's interested of an article in which his, um, the, the person who wrote uh, an article discrediting Alexander in the Atlantic magazine, um, that article is critiqued by some NDE researchers, I think very effectively, and really showing that there was uh, even some, um, you know, like whatever yeah. in journalism is called malpractice, you know, in, in representing mm -hmm. his, his story. Yeah, the, the, the article that was written in, um, what, what journal was it? The, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but um, I spoke with Dr. Abin Alexander for my podcast and I was careful that I brought up that subject because he's, as you say, he's, he's had a lot of, of, of stick about his apparent malpractice in the past. And um, it was Luke Dittrich wrote it. Yes. I can't remember in which journal it was, but he wrote it. Well, it, and it, was in the, it was in the Atlantic. I think it was the Atlantic it Monthly, was. something like but that. But there, there yeah. was the original, um, I keep thinking of it, Esquire. It was in Esquire. Esquire. You're right. It was Esquire. And I made sure I brought that up with, with Dr. Alexander because not many people seem to. And it's the thing people will know about the Esquire article, but they don't know about the rebuttal to that. Mm -hmm. And again, you must must look at both to understand exactly what's going on. And you know, there's, there's cases in that Esquire article where people have been misrepresented, um, assumptions have been made, and it's really it's really worth looking at both. You know, don't don't just look at the rebuttal and take our word for it that he's not a fraud. L look at all the all the claims and come to your own decision, but be sure to look at it fairly. I will, I will say yeah. this. I think personal yeah. experience is important. As a matter of fact, the next episode we do on Agree to Argue is not the very topic, is personal experience persuasive to other people. Um, I do think, Dr. Holden, you have experienced these things. There's no question in my mind. That, and this is the difference between what I, what the, a lot of the, you know, these communities, they would just hype again, hyper doubt. Oh, she's lying. She didn't experience these things. It's that kind of attitude. I give a lot more principal charity. I'm, I absolutely... You know, I'm fine with saying I do think that you've experienced these things. Um, I've experienced things that I cannot relate to other people. So if I have, probably you have as well. Um, told, I think that's a very, very charitable interpretation. But I, I think it all boils down to these are still things that are unknown. Uh, we don't know why. We don't know why maybe spontaneous mediumship happens. Uh, do I believe that it is a communication with the dead? No. But if we could determine that would be the case, that would be completely awesome. But I don't think that is the case. But I do think there is an explanation, probably. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the principle of sufficient reason. But I do think that in this case, why we experience things that we attribute to maybe kind of a supernatural or paranormal experience uh, has some kind of underlying reason. What that reason is, straight up, I have no idea. Hmm. If we want to kind of wrap it up, I would like to, if, if maybe Jan would be, would be interested in coming back and maybe discussing things like terminal lucidity and some of these other phenomena. I think mm -hmm. that they, again, it all kind of converges into a group of evidence as opposed to one phenomena. But I think a good way to finish it off is to say that, you know, the physical idea of materialism is very good and it works very well for our day-to-day -day life. However, when you do serious research into this area of phenomena relating to anomalous experience and you do it openly, you will find that there is more than enough evidence to suggest that our model of the brain and its interaction or creation of consciousness is incomplete. Maybe that the emergence theory does not parsimoniously explain all of the data. And if you approach it purely from a scientific way, truly scientific way, I think it can be in no doubt that perhaps there is something going on that we don't really understand. And maybe it's a piece or a form of nature that 
operates in a different way. You know, you can call it non-physical, you can call it spiritual, you can call it godly. Um, but regardless, something is certainly going on that warrants further investigation and in a serious, non-judgmental fashion. And the standard ridicule that you hear is to be expected on any kind of paradigm shift, but it's not productive. And we must be honest with ourselves that we don't understand everything. We don't understand a percentage of everything. The universe and creation is so huge that anything really is possible. And, and evidence is suggesting we really look into this a bit more. Uh, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. I mean, yeah. do, you mind, do you mind quickly if I plug my own stuff? By all means. I mean, it's, I don't do it for any kind of popularity. It's my own research that I'm doing it mainly for. That's why I save everything. Um, but if anybody's interested in this sort of thing, you know, my YouTube channel and Facebook group and blog is called Seeking Eye. It's just looking at this kind of stuff, mainly life after death, but any phenomena relating to it and these kind of social things that I, I want to put my two cents across on. I did one about gender today. And that was really um and ah whether to do that one. <laughs> but I decided to <laughs> risk it and go for it. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you know, just pop over to Seeking Eye. I'd love to have you there. And I just want to thank hey. the people that came in to, to listen to this. Um, if you guys want more of this stuff, let me know in the comments. This is, again, what I like to have on my channel, these types of discussions. So I'm thrilled to death that Darren had arranged this over, it's been a couple of months, I guess, uh, with Dr. Yes. Holden. Yeah. So, I mean, because of time elements and weird things that were happening. And, you know, 2020, kind of can't plan on anything. But uh, I'm definitely doing yeah. a lot more stuff like this on my show. It, preliminary stuff, obviously, until we can get uh, back non sequitur show. But uh, Dr. Holden, this was fascinating. Uh, I do appreciate you very much coming in and answering you know, questions. And I, I, again, I, I, I don't have to, to agree uh, with my with the people that I have conversations with. But I love the fact when they do so, in, you know, intellectually and honestly. That's the best I can ask for, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And does anything you want to wrap it up on your on your end, Dr. Holden? Go ahead. Um, I've I've very much enjoyed this, and um, and you know, it, beyond the seeking truth um and just seeking accurate knowledge um there's there may be something at stake uh in terms of what we conclude about um the nature of life and survival of consciousness after death and so forth near death experiencers many report that in their nde they experienced a life review and in that experience they reviewed and re-experienced and experienced being on the receiving end of everything they'd ever done. And whenever they had done something that had hurt someone or helped someone, they experienced being the recipient. They, they got what they had given. And so, um, so uh, what people come away with is a, um, an ethic about uh, really doing unto others, not as you would have them do unto you, but as they are you. There is the separation that we perceive in this state of existence is um, real at this level, and it's also not real at another level. And that what I do to you, I do to myself. And so, um, so there's, there may be something at stake about, um, you know, drawing conclusions about this. And some people could be going through life missing something really important, an important pr operating principle. So one of the things I like about uh, our exchange today is that we, um, we exercise, even though that wasn't our explicit intention, we still exercise that principle. We um, listen to each other and heard each other's points of view, didn't always agree, but always treated each other with respect. And I've really valued that and, and appreciate this. And, and thank you both for, for this great experience. Thank you as well. And also nice to meet you all, everyone in the chat. I suppose that's, that's necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah good to meet you, Steve. <laughs> all right, take care. Bye-bye. Take care.